Good morning again everyone. I'm joined by the lovely Candice and we're here in East Tilbury in Essex and yeah. again and we're back at Coal House Fault and it's open today. It's an open day so it's Sunday. I've got to be in work later on. We're going to have a little look round here. Um, always wanted to go in here. I've had a look at everything else in the surrounding area except the fault. So without further ado let's get exploring. In 1402 Following a French incursion during the preceding reign, Henry IV gave permission for a local defence system to be put in place. In 1540, Henry VIII ordered that a blockhouse be built at Coalhouse Point. This was one of five installations built either side of the river, being part of a national defence system designed to counter any Rome-inspired invasion of England. In 1799, when a French invasion was feared, a new battery was built at East Tilbury. Following its demise circa 1855, a small fort incorporating the 1979 site was constructed. From 1861 to 1874, in response to Parliament's decree and the perceived threat of yet another French invasion, Coal House Fort and Sister Forts at Cliff and Shawmead in Kent were built. For part of the overall construction period, they were supervised by Lieutenant Colonel Charles George Gordon, later General Gordon of Khartoum. Coalhouse Fort continued to be modified to keep pace with military technology and occupied by the military through the two world wars up to their departure in 1962. Following the military departure, the fort was required by Thurrock Council from 1983 to the present day, it is maintained by the Coal House Fault Project. The fault that you see today was built between 1861 and 1874 on the site of earlier fortifications. It was designed to work in tandem with Sean Mead and Cliff Forts on the opposite bank of the river, providing a triangle of crossfire to prevent enemy shipping advancing up the Thames towards London. Built between 1861 and 1874 as part of the first line of defence for London against possible invasion via the River Thames, the fault was state-of-the-art for the period, with thick granite walls behind which have large vaulted caverns known as casemates. These house heavy rifled muzzle-loading guns up to 38 tonnes. Ammunition for these guns was stored below in magazines linked by a continuous double tunnel system. Improvements in the design of both warships and breech-loading guns soon made the fault and its RML guns obsolete. Circa 1903 saw the fault was kept operational by the installation of new breech-loading guns on the roof. During World War II these were replaced by even more modern guns. The Royal Navy was also present at the fault operating a degaussing monitoring station that was to play a vital role in checking a ship's protection against magnetic mines. OK, we're going to go and have a little look in this World War II Anderson shelter. Oh, it's got a funny smell to it in here. <laughs> I'm guessing this is reconstructed, I don't think it's original. <laughs> and then through this little room in here, Probably if you were six foot plus, you'd have to stoop in here. I mean, I could stand up straight in here. And then you would have had, looks like a little bed. Can't imagine it would have been that comfy, but you know. The Memorial Park is dedicated to all members of the British forces who served and gave their lives for the cause of freedom. The centrepiece of the park has a third scale replica of the original obelisk that stood outside the fault and was unceremoniously blown up in 1917. When the fault was originally armed in 1874, 17 guns were installed inside this arc of granite faced casemates and three in an open battery. The guns were rifled muzzle loaders and were protected from enemy fire behind thick wrought iron gun ports. 
The gunners received instruction via voice pipes entering the casemates from a rooftop command post. Operating guns like these in the confined casemates could put enormous pressure on the human body. When the guns recoiled after firing, they also filled the space with choking smoke. Thankfully, the guns at Coalhouse Fort were never fired in anger. In Victorian times, the barracks could house a garrison of 180 men and 6 officers. It had a cookhouse, mess rooms, laundry, washrooms, married quarters for use in peacetime, and a 14-bed hospital. An elegant iron veranda ran around the inward-facing wall at first floor level. Designed to be protected from all angles, the outward facing windows in the living quarters had internal bulletproof steel shutters with loopholes through which muskets or rifles could be fired. During an emergency, the gunners would move from the barracks to live in the rear section of the casemates at the ready next to the guns. The original Victorian armament was updated to keep pace with advancements in military technology and there is evidence of different phases of defence history to be discovered here today. The fort played an important strategic role in the Thames defences during both the First and Second World Wars. It was decommissioned in 1949. The Fault Museum exhibits the history of the fort from its inception to the present day with many items of military interest including a naval area dedicated to the time when the fort was known as HMS St Clement. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
So this here would have been one of the, the lamps they would have used in the underground magazines during the Napoleonic era. So you see those light boxes, um, which are like air vents in like Who Fault, uh, Darnit Fault, Coal House. And yeah, they're the lamps they would have used to light the underground passageways. Thameside Aviation Museum has a large selection of aviation material from many archaeological digs in South East England together with their histories which remind us of these brave flyers who gave so much to keep us free. survival dinghy. Here Andy, fancy darn it fault with that. Thank you. 
Whole fruit of night. Looking for women, did you say? <laughs> yeah. Typical. Low of the tone, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, so that was a very quick look at in the museum. Apologies, a bit of a whistle stop tour. Um, I think they're singing over here as well, it's really nice. And uh, I think it's uh, two ladies dressed as a. Uh, what are they again? What are they dressed in? What uniforms are they? I don't know. I don't know if they're the wrens that, or they're just. I don't know what they are. There they are. It's pretty cool though, isn't it? Tell you what, you get your money's worth here, don't you? <laughs> Four quid to come in here, people. Amazing. Every last Sunday of the month. Brilliant. Right, we've just heard on the loudspeaker there's a guided tour in the next five minutes. Quids in. We get to see all the tunnels and stuff like that as well. Banging. <laughs> I'm definitely going on that tour, without a doubt. And you're coming with me. Ammunition was stored in vaulted chambers called magazines directly below the gun casemates, safely beyond the reach of enemy fire. The magazines are in pairs, one for shells and one for cartridges. When needed, the ammunition was raised up to the guns on lifts. The magazines were lit by oil lamps, as naked flames could have caused the gunpowder to explode. A separate corridor or lighting tunnel was used to carry the lamps to glass fronted recesses in the magazine chamber walls. Men working in the magazines wore special cotton clothing and shoes to prevent sparks from metal or grit. They changed out of their regular uniforms which had metal buttons and buckles in a lobby area and were only allowed past an entry barrier when dressed in their safety clothing.
In 1903, most of the large, obsolete muzzle-loading guns were removed. The armament was upgraded with eight breech-loading quick-fire guns housed in concrete emplacements on the roof. Sometime later, to aid night firing, electric searchlights were also erected on the roof. The lights were powered by generators housed in what is now the engine room cafe. During the First World War, Number 2 Company, Royal Garrison Artillery, were assigned to the guns and 2nd Company, London Electrical Engineers, to the searchlights. The fort was instructed to fire a warning shot across the bow of any suspect ship which refused to stop for inspection. During the Second World War, two naval guns from HMS Hood were mounted on the roof together with two remotely controlled searchlights and a Bofors anti-aircraft gun. The fort also acted as a degaussing station, using sensors submerged in the river to check that the magnetic fields of outbound ships were sufficiently neutralised to be undetectable by enemy magnetic mines. Right, well we've just, we just had like a 45 minute tour of some of the tunnels, he couldn't show all of them um, and most of the stuff on the roof hands down probably the best tour I've ever been on absolutely brilliant so if you're thinking of visiting Coel's Fault definitely take the guided tour it's no extra cost four quid to get in absolute bargain oh brilliant absolutely brilliant I was hanging on his every word I was like yeah go on go on I was like it's brilliant yeah absolutely blinding um, we're going to have another little look round some of the other bits that we missed. I think we've more or less covered it, the, the tour helped with that. It was really, really good. Right, you're not allowed to use any of this stuff here. You're not allowed to visit any of that. Someone just got told off and they're, they're getting read the right act now over there. Yeah, but this bit's all completely unsafe, so that's that's why you can't go in there. I don't, that's not got a floor. It hasn't got a floor, yeah, because there would have been like this walkway around here, and then there would have been a walkway further up here. Um, oh look, it's a three wheeler there. Got some more old like military vehicles and stuff. So yeah, that was that was a look round Coal House Fault. Absolutely brilliant. It's the best four quid I think I've spent in a long time. Um, I'd definitely come back again. So Jake, if you are watching, you're interested, we'll go back here again definitely. I'd love to see more of the tunnels and stuff. Um, that would be great, but it is what it is. But still, the fact we got to go on that tour was pretty cool. Amazing, amazing structure here so much history it's brilliant 40 minutes up the road from me banging anyways right yeah we'll head to the calf cheers for watching hope you enjoyed it get in the comments let us know what you think cheers for your support as always and i'll see you again soon see you later everyone bye cheers